love. Yeah. Baby love. It's just so you know, it, feel, it feels All that right. We're live. Hear the babies. Feels the heart <laughs> chakra. Okay. It says we're live. Hello, hello. It's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, seven o'clock on the East Coast, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. in London, and most of Europe. And I got smart to figure out times and I put it on my phone. So now I know that it's 4.30 a.m. in New Delhi, 9 o'clock a.m. Wednesday morning in Brisbane, and Auckland's the one I always forget, midnight in Auckland. So no, no, not midnight, noon, noon in Auckland. And it's Facebook Live. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you again. And um, uh, we have a very special guest today, Dr. Elena Villanova. And I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Liam, am I saying the last name Villanueva? Villanueva. Mm -hmm. Villanueva. Thank you. Thank you. I have to learn more Spanish. <laughs> to pronounce it correctly. And um, uh, we're in for a treat. We're going to talk today about what I consider the primary paradigm that everyone has to think from when the topic is. I want to be healthier. This is the primary, most important time. Not what pill do I take because I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's or what diet do I do, which is really important. All those things are important, but this is the primary paradigm. And the primary paradigm is where is the inflammation coming from that's the trigger causing my symptoms? Mm -hmm. That's primary. And, you know, I've been dilly-dallying around with that for many years, talking about the importance of inflammation. And this year, 2022, is the year where we have been just, like, right here with you, inflammation, inflammation, so that everyone can be comfortable sitting with the question, where does inflammation come from? Because there's so much, so many different triggers there's no one trigger. And Dr. Elena is an expert in this. And um, so let's just start off with, um, why is this a topic that you focused on? Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, as I was saying earlier, I don't know how many of you guys heard it, but you know, Tom is a mentor of mine and I've loved Tom from the time I first read some of his first books and and um, and now I'm finding myself getting to be on stages alongside Dr. Tom. So super excited to be here with you. Um, you know, the reason that it's all about inflammation is because it, it pretty much is the root cause of all disease, whether you're talking, you know, um, autoimmune disorders or mental health issues or, you know, neurodegenerative issues, inflammation always plays a huge role in either causing or exacerbating all of these different conditions. But there's a deeper question that needs to be answered. And that's where, you know, unless people are lucky enough to get on and get to get educated by people like you and myself, um, they, you can go online and you can look up what their, what is the underlying cause of inflammation. And it actually talks about taking medications for edema, make it doesn't even tell you what the underlying cause is. It makes it sound like it's a condition in and of itself, and that it needs to be treated with medications. I talk about that in, I believe, part um, part three, which is tonight of our inflammation masterclass. I actually show this actual definition from, I believe it was like WebMD or something. I don't remember where I found it online. Talk Talking about the info, the under, talking about what the definition of inflammation and how you treat it is, and you know this is a huge problem because we have to we have to have a paradigm shift and teach people what the underlying causes are of their engines breaking down in their body, and these engines break down because of inflammation. We have to figure out what's causing that, and there are a number of different things that can cause inflammation. Yes, there are. There are. Uh Given this is Facebook Live, it's always fun to just start off and every once in a while uh, just kind of take it a little bit looser. And I just want to say hello to the people that have already signed in and, and like done a little shout out. Esther's here. Uh, Wanda's in uh, from Long Island. Laura, our, our own Laura in Oregon. Hi, Laura. Uh, Terry Boyle's here from San Diego. Becky's here from Northern British Columbia. Uh, Matt 
Mad, Madchen, Mad, Madchen Marie. Madchen Marie is here from New Zealand. Greetings, Mad, Madchen. Uh, Judy's here, Sarah's here, uh, Lucia's here from Tucson. So tell us where you're from, guys, and, and what time is it there so that I get that right for everyone. But it's wonderful to see that people are here from all over the world. Thank you all so much. And as you have questions that you'd like uh, for Dr. Elena or myself to address, put them in the Q&A, not the chat, put them in the Q&A, and we will get, get to them. Uh, Jill's here from Southern California. Uh, Tamara's watching. Kyla's here from Australia. Hey, Kyla. Now, there's two different time zones, I think, in Australia, uh, maybe more. Uh, what's, what's the time where you are, Kyla? I'm, a, I'm kind of a geek about time. I know it helps me to kind of position how people can be at any stage of their day, and they're here. Uh, we get a lot of people coming from Scandinavian countries where it's midnight or one in the morning from India. It's four in the morning, 4.30 in the morning in India. Uh, and I'm really um, touched by, uh, now I, I like to think they're staying up to watch us, but it really might be that they can't sleep. And maybe if they turn on O'Brien, they'll go to sleep. I don't know, they'll be able to fall asleep. But thank you all for being here. Claire is here, it's midnight in Ireland. And Clara gave us a shamrock. Thank you, Clara. Or not, not Clara. Uh, Kiara, C-I-A-R-A, Kiara. Thank, thank you so much uh, for that. Hello, everyone. Yes, yeah, so exciting yeah. to see people here from all over the all over the globe. Yeah, Colin's from Bridlington, UK. Six minutes past midnight. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Quincy. Oh the, oh, oh, the Quincy and the family are here. Oh, how wonderful uh, in Iowa. Hi, everybody. Uh, we have a very favorite family in Iowa that's with us every week and, and they sit around the dinner table and they're, they're attentive and uh, just love the vision of you guys watching us. So thank you so much for being here with us today. So this thing about inflammation, um, in, in my book, um, I don't see inflammation as a contributor to disease. I see inflammation as the mechanism of disease. That, um, you know, my son, sometimes he loves to just sit in the car. Um, when he's a little restless, you know, Marzi or um, uh, our, our nanny will take him out and sit in the car and they turn the car on and, you know, he just has the steering wheel and he's holding it like this and he's pushing buttons and he drains my water tank for the windshield wiper because he's figured out how to get the squirter to come on, you know, and all of that. Uh, uh, but in, on my car, you can push the ignition button and the lights come on and the, the fan comes on and the radio comes on, but you can't start the car. And I told uh, the nanny, I said, don't ever let him see you put your foot on the brake when you start the car, make sure he can't see that because I don't want him to know how to actually start the car. You know, it's okay if he puts his finger on the ignition switch and the lights come on and that that's fine, you know, that's fine. Why am I telling you that silly story? Because inflammation, you have to have your foot on the brake to start the car. You have to have inflammation to develop disease. It doesn't matter what the disease is, they all, the mechanism in the development of every, I only know of one disease that is not a disease of inflammation. Dr. Lena, you may know of others and I'd really like to learn if you do, but I only know of one. There's a sodium deficiency um, uh, in the, uh, for children. And if they have a severe sodium deficiency, there's an area of their brain that um, gets sclerosed from that. And it's not an inflammatory process. But as far as I know, every other condition is a condition of inflammation. So this is not something that you add on to everything else you're doing for your Hashimoto's or for your right. CDI. You don't add on addressing inflammation. You begin with inflammation. So I just want to be really clear about the emphasis of how important this topic is for you, for your loved ones, for your children, this topic of... Now, um, I also say that... The most common source of inflammation is what's on the end of your fork. 
There are others or many others, but the most common one and the place where most people can start is what's on the end of your fork. And I also say there are no neutrals. The only neutral is healthy water. Everything else that goes in, your body has to do something with. Healthy water is the neutral. So Dr. Elena, from that perspective, how do you start when you're teaching people about the importance of uh, addressing inflammation? I love where you took that. Um, and that's why I think it's important to, to start as a foundation is to teach people that inflammation is a natural mechanism in the body and it's actually used in the healing process. But what can cause the inflammation to, you know, um, keep burning and causing problems, so to speak, that's more of a metaphor, but you know, what can, what can cause disease is when the inflammation no longer is able to do its job and help in the healing process of the body. Um, where you have this chronic inflammatory reaction, it's like the fire is always burning. It doesn't just do its job and then burn out. It's going all the time. And so teaching people that like inflammation is not necessarily an enemy. It's a necessary part of survival for the human body. Um, but just like your blood pressure and your blood sugar levels and your brain hormone levels and your thyroid hormone levels and your, you know, the amount of water that's in your body, everything needs to be in balance. You can't have too much blood sugar, you'll die. You get, if it gets too low, you'll die. Everything has to be in a balance, right? And so it's, it's the same thing with inflammation. You know, there has to be, um, we have to understand that what can take something that is supposed to be a normal part of the healing process and actually cause disease and prevent people from healing. And you're right, starting with your food, um, that's what we talked about in part one of the inflammation masterclass that started on Sunday. Um, there is a, a, a rewatch for anybody who misses, you know, the first couple of parts, but um, we spend an entire, you know, part one of our five part series talking about what you're putting in your body in terms of food. And we go into all the science, the research studies, and then we even show labs, how you can see it on a lab, like with a, with a, with a wheat zoomer or these different tests that, you know, it'll show you with irrefutable proof that, yeah, every time you eat this, you're having a major fire going on in your body. And with these particular sets of data that we can see, it's even causing massive inflammation and damage in your brain too. So, you know, food is like, it's foundation to everything. And that's where we have to have a paradigm shift because you can't just say, well, I'm gonna take this pill and then I'm gonna do this and everything's gonna be fine. No, like you have to, you get an opportunity to wake up tomorrow and, and birth yourself into a new life. And, and everything in that is going to be different. The way you think, your belief systems, uh, all of that, as you can change the way you think, as you can change your belief systems, um, as you can change your story, that makes it more easy and natural to change a habit. Then the new habits follow. If you're just trying to change a habit without any of that kind of foundational perspective, a shift in your perspective, then you're you're just not going to you're, you're going to have a much harder time making those long term necessary changes that you need so that you can have the health and the vibrancy that you want so you can create the story of your life that you right. want. There's a really good question that came in from Colin Dunwell and Colin says, so if it is not about specific diseases, how do we prevent inflammation? And Colin, that's a great question. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a visual here. I'm going to share my screen for a minute. And I want to show you this drawing that was done um, in a research paper that came out uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And what you see here is that systemic chronic inflammation, that wheel, that cog is right in the center. And when that thing gets turned, then you turn the wheel to the right. And depending on your genetics and how you've lived your life so far, you may get diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, brain deterioration diseases, the list goes on and on. That inflammation turns the wheel in the development of specific diseases. So it's important to recognize the specific diseases, but what triggers them, where are they coming from? They're coming from this systemic chronic inflammation. 
Now, what you learn in my books and Dr. Elena's masterclass that we'll, we'll post the link here for you guys for her masterclass, what you learn is that it's everything on the left that you have to investigate to see what, where is the inflammation coming from? Is it chronic infections, you know, like bacteria and bugs and viruses or inactivity or obesity or too many bad guys, not enough good guys in the gut? Or is it the foods and you're sensitive to certain foods that don't make you sick so you don't know those foods are a problem? Or is it the amount of stress in that you're living with and creating stress hormones when excessive create more inflammation? Or is it the chemicals called xenobiotics? That's a geek term for all the chemicals that accumulate in our body. But this picture, Colin, I hope, it, I hope that it helps you understand how you prevent inflammation is by dealing with everything on the left. You have to go to the left side of the screen and look and see, do I have foods that may not be good for me causing inflammation or are there bugs or Am I carrying too much fat on my body and I have to burn off some of that fat? You just have to begin investigating where is that coming from? Dr. Elena, do you want to comment on this um, on this slide? Um, I was just uh, looking at it and just really enjoying what you put together here. This is just a really great visual depiction so that people can see, you know, what they have to address on the left as underlying causes. Um, and what 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 happens as a result if they don't address that? So, you know, what I would add to this um, is, you know, under like the uh, the isolation and the chronic stress, I would add, you know, um, unprocessed emotions, unresolved trauma, your stories that you're telling yourself, your belief systems, you know, all of that, um, and then also just to know that you know, as you very well know, that usually when people are really sick and they've developed one or a combination of these different conditions that are on the right-hand side, it's usually not one, not two, but more than two of the underlying causes that are on the left. Usually people are coming where they're presenting with a handful of three, four, or five of these things on the left. It's, it's, it's compounded. It's not just one thing. You know, people will have issues with their physical activity, right? Secondary to the stress they have at work and the relationships and all the stuff they have that's making them exhausted. And it's causing them to not sleep, you know, and their diet is off. You know, they're drinking, you know, alcohol every night to try to numb out and chill out and not knowing it's making them worse. And then they've got chemical toxins and they've got mold, you know, under the chronic infections they usually have. I mean, we, I would say like 99% of the people that we see have at least two different infections of some sort going on inside their body, right? Whether that, you know, even if that constitute is like just an overgrowth of a bacteria that doesn't play well in your gut system that maybe wouldn't show up as a typical infection in the allopathic world, but you know, we'll see a combination of all these things all happening at once. So the weight, you know, I like to use the analogy, like there's too many layers of ice on the branches of the tree and the branches are gonna break because the body can't handle all of that all of that toxic load. Um, and so that's all I would add to that is just adding to what you already have here, just filling it in a little more with just some more words, you know? That's, that's a really good point. And it's actually another, I guess I'd say division of the paradigm that you think from once you understand this thing about inflammation and how important it is uh, throughout your life to reduce the amount of excessive inflammation we have, once you understand that, then the next step is, and then everybody does the same thing. Everybody thinks, okay, what do I take to get rid of the excess inflammation? Because uh, we're trained to think that we're supposed to take something and it's going to fix everything. And the pharmaceutical industries have made billions and billions of dollars by us doing that. You know, what's the name of that box in the bathroom that's on the wall? usually has a mirror on it and, the, and you open it up and we call it a medicine cabinet. Why do we do that? Why isn't it a health cabinet? Because we're trained to think about medicine anytime we have a question about our body function. Right. That's not going to be successful. It can help short term. If you've got high blood pressure, you better take the medication until you figure out 
where's the high blood pressure coming from and you get it down naturally, then you don't need the medication anymore. But it's important to understand there's no one thing that is going to be the big kahuna. Now, gluten, now, Professor Fasano at Harvard tells us there are two things that are shown to be the most powerful triggers in developing the thing called leaky gut. That's the gateway in the development of chronic inflammation. Those two things are a small exposure to a large amount of bacteria in your gut, bad bacteria in your gut and its exhaust, which is called LPS and gluten. Those are the two most powerful triggers that contribute to leaky gut. So we almost always look at those two to start off with along with the others. But you make a really good point that there's never just one, it's two, three, four different mechanisms and people can feel overwhelmed by that. You know, when you come see us, you see Dr. Elena, you see your functional medicine doctor and they run three or four or five tests and it comes back, you got this problem, you got this problem, you got this problem, you got this problem, you got this problem. Got this problem. It's overwhelming, it's overwhelming. You say, oh my God, I can't deal with this. How am I supposed to deal with this? And the secret to all of it, the secret to all of it is base hits win the ball game. Meaning you do one little thing at a time and then you do the next little thing, and then you do the next little thing. Dr. Elena, have you found that to be helpful for people to um, uh, develop the concept that um, uh, uh, base hits win the ball game? You don't have to do it all at the same time. I agree with you, um, and you know I think it's about teaching teaching people um, to have a reasonable um, timelines or reasonable expectations uh, because look it took you probably from the time you were born to get as sick as you are now it takes it takes time and and may i pause you right there for a minute yeah because i can hear people's brains going wait a minute wait a minute i just got di not diagnosed with hashimoto's wait a minute or wait a minute, my brain just started not working very well. No, 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 no. Health and Human Services did a, uh, 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 they produced a document uh, two years ago and they showed that before you ever have any symptoms of losing memory, you have 27 years on average of killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells, killing off brain cells, before you ever notice a problem. 27 years is the average amount of time. Then you start noticing, well, your sense of smell is going or um, you're not remembering where you put your keys every once in a while. And we think the problem's starting now. As Dr. Lane was saying, no, it started, it began 27 years earlier killing off brain cells. And that's what the inflammation does in whatever tissue of your body it's affecting is starting to wear it down, wear it down. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted people no. to understand what you were saying. That This, this is, is no, this is perfect. Let's talk, let's talk more about it. I mean, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. You know, if, if you think that, you know, when you started feeling your symptom is when the problem started happening. No, your body is so resilient. Your body has a backup system for the backup system. I mean, your body has like 10 backup systems for every backup system. But what if you're not fixing the underlying issue, you're running out of time. You're, you're, you know, like you are using up and destroying all the backup systems. When your backup systems have, have come to like the last couple of backup systems, that's when you start noticing problems. And really, if you pay attention, you started noticing them before, but you were not taught how to pay attention to your body. And so you, we just keep going and keep going and keep going. Oh my God, I'm feeling tired and I'm brain foggy. I'm going to take this extra, extra coffee in the morning and drink it extra strong. And then by 11 o'clock, you're drinking a Red Bull and you just keep going. Oh, now I'm a little constipated. Well, I'll just take some of this to help me with my constipation. Oh, you know, I'm feeling a little depressed, but you just keep going and you start drinking wine at night. So it's like, this goes over years. If you really sit down and start thinking about when you first started noticing your problem, you probably started noticing some sort of symptom of whatever issue that's chronically going on now that you can't get rid of 
if you really think back, you probably started having little tiny symptoms, things that you just didn't pay attention to. You just but didn't pay attention to it and just kept on driving. You kept driving the car, even though it needed to, the, the check engine light was on, you weren't paying attention. And so it's, it's not until, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, that there's dysfunction. You literally can't function that that's when you finally give yourself the attention that you deserve. And you go, Oh, something's wrong. I've just gained 20 pounds and I'm having mood swings and my periods are off and I'm having headaches. And you get diagnosed with this Hashimoto's now, honey, like that started for you 15 or 20 years ago, maybe even longer, but your body is super resilient and it's got all these backup systems, but eventually that's when you start to notice the problem. And that's where we just need a paradigm shift. If you notice that something's going on, you know, your doctor didn't teach you this, but we're teaching you this. So you started having an issue a long time ago and all of the things that you've done unknowingly through your life have compounded the issue, right? The foods right. that you choose to eat, the the way that you decide to treat your physical body, the the lack of meditation and the lack of, you know, like learning how to process your emotions and all of these things, the, the all the chemicals you're exposed to and you don't realize that all those things over time, over 20, 30 years, really caused a lot of damage. And then that's when you end up with this chronic disease. And you think, because your doctor tells you, oh, well, this just happened. You were fine last year. No, you weren't fine last year. You just weren't, you know, critical. You weren't critically sick where the doctor had to do something. Yeah. So, so the, great. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. And so everyone, you all understand that what you've got now is the result of unknown problems that weren't recognized for years that built up. So let's move past that now. That's just a basic 101 concept to understand. Inflammation is the the fuel for the development of every chronic disease that we get. Uh, eight out of the top 10 causes of death in the US today are chronic inflammatory diseases. Eight out of the top 10. The only two that are not are accidental injuries and suicide. Although arguably suicide is a depressive state and depression is an inflammatory condition. So I think nine out of the top 10 causes of death, which means when you're going down, it'll be because of the accumulative damage from inflammation in your life. So the more that you can reduce the inflammation, the easier it's gonna be for you to have a vibrant, dynamic, um, your senior years, let alone reduce the symptoms that you have at whatever age you're at now. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that has come in from Anonymous, okay, um, how do we access the entire part of the series about inflammation Dr. B is referring to? I think, uh, Dr. Tom, it looks like you um, just posted, looks like it's the most recent thing on the chat. There's a link there for the Inflammation Masterclass. You can go there and register. Now, we are in part three tonight that starts, I think, a little bit later tonight, but you can watch it. I think for several hours. Um, so if you missed part, if you like part three and part four and five, and you want to go back and watch the rest of it, there is going to be a replay. Just let you know now. We are going to do a replay the following weekend, but I would go ahead and register for it. There's a lot of science in here. Um, I know, I mean, I know that, you know, Dr. Tom, if you watched it, you would you would be so proud. You you would absolutely love it. I so much science, so much data, and we have thousands of case studies that we've been collecting and I show case studies on these people with all different kinds of conditions I go through with each case study and I teach all of you if you guys sign up you're going to get to to look at these what the person came with all the different symptoms and the conditions that they had were diagnosed with if they were on medications what medications they were on and then what we found as underlying causes because there's always a ton of them just like Dr. Tom and I were talking about and, um, and, and then what the labs showed to verify all of that. And then I take the, you through the process of the case study and show you how long it took to get the toxins out, how long it took to get their body so their body can heal. Because your body can't heal when it's full of garbage. You got to get the garbage out. We'll talk about that analogy in just a minute because I know Dr. Tom loves the analogies. And, um, and so, but we will take you through these case studies and you can see how long it took, reasonable expectations we talked about, 
what types of labs you can do and how you can get your body to heal. Great, great, great. Next question. I had a high CRP. Now that is a blood test marker of inflammation, systemic inflammation. So mm -hmm. it's not good to have a high CRP and this person knows that. I had a high CRP and my doctor said I must have had a urinary tract infection, but I didn't. I did have a root canal infection and gained so much weight and developed Hashimoto's. Will the information resolve, inflammation resolve if I get the tooth removed? Well, um, I'm gonna let Dr. Elena address this, but I'm gonna say first that your doctor who thought, oh, you must have a urinary tract infection when you didn't have any symptoms, and that's, that's a no brainer to test for. That's a simple urine test, and you can find out in five minutes, just the nurse does a dipstick in the urine to see uh, are there a lot of white blood cells. I mean, so that's a no brainer. And unfortunately, your doctor was not aware that a high CRP is just a marker that says, you've got a lot of inflammation right now. It doesn't tell you anything more than that. It tells you that there's a whole lot of inflammation and that that is associated with acceleration of disease development and um, uh, morbidity, getting sick and dying, mortality. But it doesn't tell you anything other than there's a lot of inflammation right now. Dr. Lena, how, how would you address this about the Hashimoto's and the root canal or the tooth removal? The tooth removal. So, um, you know what? I totally agree with you. I'll just expand on what you said. Um, CRP is an inflammatory marker that tells you you have inflammation. You know, if he's guessing that it's a urinary tract infection, why didn't he test you for that? That's like a $5 test. I mean, they could do it right there. That makes absolutely zero sense to me. I, that sounds like a cop out because he doesn't know what to do about it except give you some anti-inflammatories, which, you know, it's, it's like, why would he even say that? If you want to know what's causing the inflammation, you can start with your foods. Start there. Dr. Tom gives a lot of information on it. We do too. Start with your foods. Start reducing your exposure to chemical toxins in your environment. We talk extensively about that in part two. Um, and you can get some testing so that you can see what chemicals do you have in your body? Do you have mold toxicity in your body? What foods are you eating that may be causing more inflammation? And do you have leaky gut? Because that's going to make you have even more inflammatory reactions to more foods. If you have leaky gut, you can test for that. So there's all these baseline tests that you can do so that you can identify all of the different root causes of your inflammation. That's where you need to start. Agreed, fully agreed. Uh, Jane had a question. Is there anything that can be done for someone who has had a broken nose more than once and now has scar tissue inside the nose, which makes their nose look lumpy down one side on the outside of their nose? Thank you both. And uh, Jane, I'll start on that one. And that is, you, know, you need to talk to a uh, plastic surgeon. Or, um, I don't know. I don't know what you can do for that, but maybe um, uh, uh, Dr. Elena has another answer. Yeah. So if it's for if it's for scar tissue, and you know that that's scar tissue adhesions that's creating this like kind of a weird look on your face, because the scar tissue can do that. It can actually like. Let me see if I can show you an example. If if I grab my shirt here, if I grab myself and twist it, guess where I can feel that? I can feel that way over here on this side. Right, I'm twisting the shirt. This is what fascia does. And it can create these like deformities and dimples on the top of your skin, which that, you know, if that's truly a, a scar tissue issue, you can you, you find yourself or do some studying on your own and learn how to do a gentle myofascial release. You can probably add some red light laser, cold laser therapy to that as well. And you can release the scar tissue anywhere in your body you can do that and so if that's truly scar tissue and not like a, a bony like a like a you know bone spur or something that's grown in that area that you can address if you go to a plastic surgeon um you know they would probably tell you one of two things just because i have two uncles who are plastic surgeons and i used to hang out with them a lot i thought i was going to do that one day so i used to work, work for them they, they would probably say um there's nothing much we can do about it. If we do surgery, it could make it worse because every time that you go in and you cut, you're going to make more scar tissue. 
right? And your body may make more scar tissue than like the average person per se. Um, or um, they might um, they might have some lasers in their clinic that they know could maybe help with that. Right. Um, but I think you would want to do a laser in combination with a manual, very gentle myofascial re release. I would say it's definitely worth trying. That's exactly what I would do if I was having that issue. You know, and I'm embarrassed by my first answer because I just wasn't thinking. Uh, uh, and full disclosure, I got bit by four fire ants yesterday and my right leg is still swollen quite a bit. So I'm uh, I'm not operating on all uh, eight cylinders. Oh, right? eight cylinders. Yeah. Dr. <laughs> Tommy, you're a genius. I think we all know that. That's uh, but in, in that your works. answer. And that, that was such a great visual that one of the things that you can do, there's a great book. It's on Amazon. It's called The Oil That Heals. And it's a little paperback book, easy to read. Uh, it's a doctor who's in practice over 50 years, a country doctor talking about castor oil packs oh, and, mm -hmm. and how wonderful they are with scars. Well, he had a whole section about scars and how you can completely change um, the, the skin appearance of scars with castor oil packs. And we'll put the link in here for um, the Queen of Thrones um, is a doctor in San Diego who has put together castor oil packs that are for your eyes and thus for your nose, um, which just help with sleeping so much. Uh, my team will put the link in here for that so that you can take a look and see um, what uh, what is available to you, but certainly. Uh, castor oil, oil is a great idea. Like, you know, castor oil is so, it, it works for so many things like ovarian cysts and all this. And I don't understand the mechanism of action behind that, but um, castor oil really, really can do some amazing things. I want that link. I, really? I totally want that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, and that book is just, it was a jaw dropping, really simple, easy to read, Nice man, you can tell by the writing, you know, uh, uh, but he talks about breast cancer and, and uh, uh, scars and ear infections. And, and I've, I've addressed so many ear infections in children by having parents put castor oil packs on their belly because 70 to 80% of the immune system's in your gut. And when you put a castor oil pack on and it's so comfortable and um, easy to do. Uh, the next day, many times the ear infection is almost gone or gone when they do that. And I've had many, Incredible. many experiences about that. So um, uh, there's a couple things there uh, that may help for you uh, uh, on, on your nose. Uh, Kimberly asks, how do you test for leaky gut? Dr. Alina? Oh, um, you know what? That's really, really cool. I, I, I remember a time when we um, didn't have tests for it, but we were teaching people about it. And, but there was like no test to really help people really like understand that it was a real thing and that it's actually like it's a real thing and it's true. Um, you can do tests for it through labs and there are different markers that you can look at. So um, calprotectin is a marker that you can look, wait, is it calprotectin? That's the one marker. And then you have zonulin, that's a marker for the inflammation in the gut. And so, and then, and you can look at, you know, and you can look at some of the other, um, um, uh, some of the other immune reactivity. But so there are very specific markers that you can look at. And if you order like a, if you order a gut zoomer from a lab, a lab company called Vibrant, uh, I know Dr. Tom, you do a lot of work with them. We do too. Um, they have in their gut zoomer, they look at the calprotectin markers and the zonulin markers and some of the other markers, SIGA, or I don't remember which other ones that they look at. And then you can do a, a GI map that's looking at like, it, it's, um, I don't remember exactly how the test is done, but they're looking at like DNA evidence uh, of their of of like pathogens and stuff. Plus, they also will look at zonulin and they'll look at a couple of inflammatory markers. So there actually are markers now in gut testing that are specific to be able to look for leaky gut. I have um, had the privilege of lecturing all over the world, and uh, we're going to 
Dublin, uh, two talks in Dublin and five talks in London and then Rome in June. And when I do these talks for physician groups, um, at the break, I always go down to the vendor area where uh, there are uh, the companies that have products they want their doctors to use. And I always look at the labs and see what labs are available in that country. And I can tell you with a great deal of confidence, the most accurate test for leaky gut in the world, and I'm not saying that lightly, the most accurate test is called the wheat zoomer because the wheat zoomer, they included the markers for leaky gut in that test. So not only do you get to test for problems with wheat, but you also get the section of the test for leaky gut. And the markers they look at are, uh, this, this gets a little technical now, but zonulin, as Dr. Elena said, they look for antibodies to zonulin. They look at the zonulin level. They look at antibodies to active myosin. They look at antibodies to LPS. LPS is, stands for lipopolysaccharide. This is what causes eventually sepsis, is years of this LPS. LPS is the exhaust of bad bacteria. You know, if I exercise really hard and the next day my arm muscle is sore, we know it's just lactic acid. It didn't get flushed out. You couldn't be sore for a day or two, it's fine. Lactic acid is the exhaust of your muscle cells. Your bacteria has exhaust. The bacteria in your gut has exhaust that it's producing all the time. And, and if you have too much bad bacteria, the exhaust of the bad bacteria is called LPS. And if you have high levels of LPS and your immune system's fighting this LPS, that's a classic marker for leaky gut. So it's looking at a number of markers for leaky gut. The test is called the wheat zoomer. Mm -hmm. There's no test like it anywhere in the world. And it's extremely accurate. Uh, we aren't going to talk much about testing tonight, but when I'm on stage, I tell doctors all the time, do you want to know if the tests you're doing are accurate or not? And you see a bunch of guys just start to cross their hands like this, you know, well, of course my tests are accurate. Really? You think so? Then when you're having blood drawn on a patient, take two tubes out instead of one. And with the second tube, put a different name on it and order the same test. So you're going to send in two tubes, one with the name of the patient and one with a phony name. And when the test results come back, what do you think the test results should look like? They should be the same or really close. But what you find so often, I didn't believe this until a doc talked about it on stage like 25, 30 years ago and I started doing it. And I spent the money for the second test and docs don't like to spend money any more than anyone else does but they'll do it, you know, once or twice. And when you see this and your eyes just pop out of your head at the differences in the two test results, it's like, what, what? Then the doctor is left so confused, not knowing what to do. Well, what am I gonna tell the patient here? Well, this test result has the patient's name on it, but this test result has a phony name on it, but it's the same blood. The, the lab Vibrant, Vibrant Wellness, their tests are 97 to 99% accurate, right on the money every time. And that's from Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic has written a number of papers on this now in the last five years of this technology called silicone chip technology. So these Zoomer tests from Vibrant Wellness, the wheat Zoomer is the one that has the, uh, um, a test for leaky gut in it. And mm -hmm. the gut zoomer that Dr. Lane talked about is most comprehensive test to look at the good guys and the bad guys in your gut. It's, we use it often, uh, but those are the tests to look at for leaky gut. Uh, Dr. Lane, any, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that, I think we've covered that, hopefully answered everyone's questions around, around what kind of testing you can do for, for leaky gut. Uh, oh, Janet. I've got actually I have something I could add. Go ahead. 
So, so many people have done, um, I, I don't know if you've seen this too, but I've seen this over the, over the last probably four or five years, you know, people will come to us, um, having, you know, amongst all their other symptoms and whatever they have going on, they also have gut issues and they found out about leaky gut and they got on some protocols for leaky gut. And then three years later, they come in and they see us. They're like, yeah, and I've been on this leaky gut protocol and it helps while I'm on it. But when I get off of it, I don't feel a whole lot better. Like I go back to having my symptoms again and I'm like, okay, well, how long have you been doing it? Thinking, oh, well, maybe they haven't done it, you know, for long enough. And they're like, oh, I've been doing it for three years. And I'm like, what, what? You've been doing it for three years. And we, I, I think this, this takes me back to something that I was gonna touch on earlier. Remember when I talked about how you have to get the garbage out of the body so that the body can heal? The analogy that I like to use is, you know, you fall off your bike and you scrape your arm really bad. You get what, what, what some people call a road rash. So you get, you get this, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of in the sun here. And you get this really bad road rash. So what do we do with it? Do we just put some Neosporin on it, slap a Band-Aid on, or do we, you know, and is it gonna heal or do we need to do what? Do we need to debreed it? Do we need to clean it, remove the garbage, or the, the dirt, the leaves, the gravel, who knows? There's an ant in there that got stuck in there. Uh, there's some bacteria, who knows what's in there? If we don't remove these barriers to healing from the skin, it doesn't matter how many, how, if you take antibiotics, it doesn't matter how much Neosporin you put on it. It is not going to heal. It's going to get worse over time. Right. I like to use that same analogy with the body. Once you've done the testing, and we already know if you're sick, you've got toxins in your body. You've got, we just don't know which ones and how many. We, you need to find out what barriers to healing are in your body. What is all the different garbage that you have in there? And you need to get that out before you can have a very successful long-term gut healing protocol happen for you. And that's something that a lot of, you know, a lot of rookies, a lot of people, they just don't know. And they, they know they'll start their patients or their clients on gut repair before they ever find out what garbage is in there that made them sick in the first place. That takes time. That takes, we've seen Dr. Tom, I don't know if you've seen the uh, case studies I've been putting out there. Um, it takes an average of nine months to get toxins and mold out of the body. And, you know, heavy metals, some metals can come out fast and some take a long time to come out, as you know, like long, you know, two, three years even to fully come out. But chemicals and mycotoxins take an average of nine months to get that garbage out of your body. So you really need to have reasonable expectations of how long that you might you, that you'll be on your healing journey before you really start noticing really big improvements in your symptoms. We see a lot of people have that turnaround right around month nine um, that coincides with their labs, showing that the toxins have finally come down. They're almost gone or they're close to being gone. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I I always say that uh, when you've gotten to the point of a diagnosed problem, it's six months to two years to turn it around. Yeah. It's, it's just going to take a while. And yeah. because you can't pull all this toxic stuff out all at once. Your body can't work with that. Um, everyone who follows us here on Facebook Live knows I talk about Dr. Joe Pizzorno all the time. And his book, The Toxic Effect, is such a great book to understand the mechanisms behind getting these toxins out of your body and that it takes time and you you have to make sure that you're drinking enough water so you can flush this stuff out and there are so many steps to the process and for this person who your example three years uh uh of uh, as long as i take my supplements i feel good but symptoms come back well it means it's helping but there has to be a trigger that keeps throwing more gasoline on the fire mm -hmm. and the supplements are just putting the fire out to some degree but the trigger is still there and so dr elena immediately went to the whole concept of detox and she's absolutely right there's something in there that's causing the fire to come right back again so you have to learn you have to do the testing to see what is it that's in my body is it mercury is it lead is it aluminum arsenic, cadmium, organophosphates, these GMOs. Um, what is it that I've got? Bacteria, viruses. And as she said at the beginning of this show, it's many of them. There's always going to be, oh gosh, uh, someone's lucky if only two or three show up. You know, realistically, we often find seven, eight, 10 
different toxins at different levels that you just have to start working to escort this stuff out. And yeah. it takes, and that, that's why I say six months to two years. And yeah, and and this is the, the, the other thing too, is, you know, we, we've even tried um, uh, in the past, we even tried like doubling up on protocols with clients who wanted to, who were like, well, can we get it out faster? And we're like, you know, back then we didn't have the data to prove it. So we're like, sure, if you want to double up on these binders, it's not going to hurt you as, you know, and, you know, when we give them the guidelines, right, so that they can do it without having a Herxheimer or a detox response. And, uh, and, you know, the body has a very high intelligence, it knows how fast it can clean itself out and, and, and maintain the integrity of all the different systemic engines that are happening, you know, all the things that are going on in the body, it needs to maintain that integrity while it's cleaning itself out. The body can't do it any faster. I mean, not not with the technology we have right now, not with what we're doing right now. And trust me, when the new technology comes out, Dr. Tom and I were going to be on it, like because we're always looking for like what's what's coming. You know, we be, you know I believe, Dr. Tom, that you know what what we know now as advances in science is getting ready to change dramatically. Probably within the next decade, things that we just never even thought were possible okay. for things that you see on sci-fi shows that we're going to be like, oh, you know, that's actually a real thing. And you know, but right now with what we have available to us right now. It does take time, even if you doubled up on everything and you're like, I'm going to double down on this because that's what I would have done years ago. I'm like, I just want to get this over, rip the Band-Aid off and let's be done with this. But no, it actually does take time. Yeah, Marzi and I have doubled down uh, after we met and we um, uh, got married and we were talking about starting a family. We doubled down on detox and we went to Swiss Mountain Clinic and spent months there over the course of a couple of years. Uh, Marzi spent two months there one time and I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks there doing all the detox protocols that are pretty, um, uh, not um, aggressive is the wrong word, but comprehensive. But you have to create an environment to do those kinds of things where everything's taken care of for you. So there's different levels of how aggressive you can be at this. And so for the average person, we're just going to, you know, six months to a couple of years, that's what it's going to take. Uh, and as long as people understand what to expect, realistically, what to expect, they're good with this. Yep. Um, Anonymous says, what about systemic enzymes for dissolving scar tissue? And that's a really good point. Absolutely. Lots of good evidence on that. I've done that many times before. Uh, Jay says, what are your thoughts on cellular detox curing autoimmune disease? Dr. Lane, I'll let you start with that one. Well, this is a whole different paradigm shift. We're not looking to use anything to cure anything. Right. The body will cure and heal itself if you, if you identify and remove the barriers to healing. So detoxification involves removing the barriers to healing that you have found on your labs. Um, and as you do that and then re-inoculate or put back into the body what it needs so that it can heal, right? Like the plant needs minerals, sun, a certain level of, you know, of, 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 of a certain mixture of air. It needs all these different things. You do the same thing with the body. If you give it what it needs, now it can use everything you give it to heal. But when you have all these barriers to healing, these things they block the cellular doors the cellular receptor sites so that the cells can't can't accept or take in the protein that it needs we'll call those peptides you know that's a breakdown of the protein but you know it can't absorb the nutrients the vitamins it can't absorb even the oxygen it can't get what it needs to keep all those thousands of systemic engines running inside your body so it's not about you know doing this to treat or cure a particular condition. It's about identifying what's uh, preventing your body from being healthy. Your body knows how to be healthy on its own and it knows how to heal, but you have to give it the right nutrients. You have to put it in the right environment and you need to remove the things in the environment that are keeping it from healing. Really good answer. I'm going to add a different way of looking at the, the question. Always be cautious of a claim to cure autoimmune diseases, always. And you know, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer 
everything looks like a nail. You know, we're gonna cure autoimmune diseases with cellular detox. We're gonna cure autoimmune diseases with love and happiness. There's always, <laughs> <laughs> I just saw and say, hi. Hi, hi baby. that's Dr. Elena. Yes, hi, baby. yes, yes it is. Um, um, cellular detox is a really impressive, effective protocol to open up the walls of your cells to get the crud out that's in there. Um, and it's an essential component sometimes to use. It does not cure autoimmune diseases. It can be a potent contributor to calming down systemic inflammation because when your cells are full of this toxic crud long-term, then it leaks into your bloodstream it leaks into your bloodstream and you get more inflammation. You know, more gasoline came out of your cells to cause systemic inflammation. So when you clean out your cells and it takes a while to do that, so cellular detox is really good for that. <laughs> There's a priority here. There's a priority. <laughs> but um, always be cautious of any claims to cure disease with one treatment. It's more like Dr. Elena said, there's multiple things that you have to do uh, mm -hmm. in order to um, arrest. And I never talk about cures. I never talk about cures. I talk about uh, arresting the development of autoimmune diseases. Um, and that's the language the scientists use, arrest the development, not cure. Because I don't know that you ever cure an autoimmune disease. You can put it into complete remission We've done that many, many times. I know Dr. Lane has done that many, many times, but it's the weak link in your chain. You pull at a chain, it's always gonna break at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end, your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, always your weakest link, right? So you put your Hashimoto's thyroid disease into remission. Is it cured? No. You do a blood test, the antibodies are down to normal, you have no symptoms, so it doesn't look like you've got Hashimoto's. But go back to your old lifestyle for one month and then test again. And here are the antibodies, they're back again to your thyroid, right? So the thing wasn't cured. It, it's just a lousy word to use, in my opinion. You can arrest the development of autoimmune diseases and reverse them, you can do that, but Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, but um, I just uh, always be cautious when someone claims a cure is available. Mm -hmm. okay. um, says you, Jane says, you both are great. Thank you so much for what you both do. What type of coffee is best to drink? What sort of coffee machine or filter would be needed to prepare the coffee? That's really a good question, Jane. Uh, so, you know, this thing about coffee, and I'll start with this and then ask Dr. Elena to um, add the icing on the cake. Uh, you see studies that say coffee extends your life. You see studies that say coffee shortens your life. What's the answer? Well, the answer is it depends on your genes. That if you carry a specific gene, um, uh, uh, CYP1A2, if you carry that gene and you're a slow metabolizer because you carry that gene and about 30% of the population carries that gene, coffee is gonna cause more inflammation for you mm -hmm. because you can't metabolize it very well. It's just a genetic thing. And when, when you read the science on this, it's really clear. CYP1A2, coffee's not for you, man. Sorry, find something else, you know? But if you don't carry that gene, if that's not an active um, uh, uh, influencer on your detox capabilities, then coffee is great for you. What type of coffee to use? I don't have a science answer for that. We use a French press. Uh, we like the French press, but it means you have to grind the coffee a little bit coarser because if it's too fine, like for an espresso, uh, machine, um, then the French press, uh, some of the grounds come through into the coffee when you're pouring the coffee in. You know, I see in the bottom of my cup, uh, when we've gotten a grind that is too fine, 
uh, uh, than a bunch of grounds. In, and I, I don't want the grounds in my stomach. I, I don't know that it's a major problem, but uh, Dr. Lane, do you have any more information about um, the preparation of coffee or any other comments about coffee? You know, um, I might offer some things that, that maybe some people don't, don't know, but we just look for, so coffee, coffee is known to be one of those foods that mold loves coffee beans. So it's really worth it to, if you if you enjoy coffee and I do I love coffee I'm a I'm a rapid metabolizer of coffee and so that's great yeah, I enjoy it and um, I drink it probably three fourths of the year and then in between I'm taking just a break just because naturally my body wants to go to something different so I'll do hot teas or whatever but we do organic coffee so we spend more money to make sure that on the back end we're not having to spend all the money to heal ourselves from making ourselves sick. Um, so, you know, coffee is known to have mold. So you want to get an organic coffee that's also known to be tested for mold. So like uh, Dave Asprey's coffee is tested for mold. It's mold free. Uh, Starbucks that I call it Starburn because it's like kind of charred tasting coffee, but they supposedly have a decent reputation for having, you know, like mold free coffee. So you want to drink mold free organic coffee because you don't want the pesticide being sprayed on your on your coffee beans. And so go for a better quality coffee, okay? And then, um, you know, we use a French press too. So I'd say a French press, or if you're doing some sort of a pour over where you're using a filter, make sure it's like an unbleached, natural, cleaner, like maybe an organic filter or something like that. Um, the machines, I don't know the science behind, I haven't studied that either, like Dr. Tom, but I think that, you know, intuitively, like I think the, the machines probably can, get kind of dirty with the tubing on the inside of the machines after a while. And that's not stuff that we have access to to be able to clean that. So I would say that probably cleaning your coffee machine with vinegar on a regular basis, which how many people do that? Nobody does that, right? I mean, but if you realize that there's tubing on the inside of your coffee machine that can get moldy and who knows what can grow in there, probably doing it once a week, cleaning it out with vinegar, even though it can be a little stinky for some people, clean that out and make sure that you keep your your hardware clean because that's what you're processing your coffee through. Really good points, really good points. Can't emphasize enough the importance of organic because uh, you're doing coffee every day and you don't want minute doses of pesticides and insecticides. That it builds up. And they build up, they accumulate in your body. Uh, yeah. So really, really good points. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are the top three to five things a person can do to reduce their inflammation? What can we focus on first? Really good question, Dr. Elena. Um, I would say uh, number one, your food. Start eating clean. There's nothing, I mean, instead of asking the question, why is that so expensive? You should be asking yourself why it's so cheap, right? Because that's the planet's been, it's sicker than it's ever been. Not just humans, animals. I talk about the statistics of, of um of our reduction in our animal and plant population i talk about that i think in part one i show stats it's scary yeah. and i'm not going to tell you how much of our animal population that we've lost but you guys just need to go back and watch that it's it's actually i had to do a little emotional like i had to do some emotional work because when i was reading the statistics and putting those studies up for this for this um version 2.0 of our inflammation master class it kind of scared me a little bit but you know uh, food you got to do it. You do whatever you have to do to put clean food in your body, clean water in your body, reduce your exposure to the chemical toxins. Women are putting an average of like what 172 toxins on their body every day between what they're using for their personal products, to their makeup, to their perfume, to the dry cleaning chemicals that are on their clothes and the chemicals that are in their tampons you know, and then the foods that they're eating and the household cleaners that they're using and the air fresheners that they're using, you know, men are, men are not far behind. They've got hundreds of chemicals in their body too. So clean up, throw away your stuff in the house, get rid of it. If it's conventional cleaning products, get rid of it, dispose of it properly too, please. And um, buy clean products. You know, 10 years ago, 
the, 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 the cleaner organic products out there were terrible. Like the laundry soaps didn't clean and the makeup was horrible. You put it on your face and it was just like, oh, it was like the worst stuff ever. Natural deodorants did not work at all. Technology's come a long way. There are clean products out there that work so good now. So change your stuff out. Um, and then I would say definitely, um, especially if you're chronically ill, uh, you know, definitely the third thing I would say is get with somebody who understands how to do all the testing to help you discover all the underlying things that are in there that you may not know about. Yeah, agree, agree. We'll put the link in here for My Green Fills for all of you to go take a look at their website. They've got all clean products and they are they are um, doing their best to save the planet. Um, millions and millions of containers, uh, plastic containers, they've avoided using by their whole system. The first time you order, they send you the laundry detergent in the plastic thing. But you sign up you know, for their auto thing and every month they send you a refill. You just pour the refill in the initial container and add water to it and it's ready to go and it works really well to wash your Their stuff works it actually yeah it works which is great and you can get it unscented or scented so and both of them work i ended up doing the unscented one and after a couple of washes i wanted some scent so i added a bunch of um of lavender essential oil into mine but oh my gosh like that stuff is the best those people are amazing they've got a great story so you're not only supporting an american business, a small business, not a big box, because we want to, we need to move all of our money away from big box. We need to start buying from these small companies. They have a great story too, and they're actually selling clean products, healthy products that work very well. Yeah, yeah, so we'll put the link in there for you. Uh -huh. We've gone over, oh my God, we've gone over in time. You know, it just goes so fast, we can just keep going. So everyone, the link is here for Dr. Elena's masterclass sign up for it it's going on right now and you'll be able to watch the earlier uh, two episodes that came yesterday and the day before um probably on the weekend um she'll send you all the information on that so you're not missing anything it's free jump on it you'll pick up a lot of pearls dr lena thank you once again for being here today it's really a pleasure it's so easy to dance together with you Oh, I, I just absolutely adore you. Adore your family. I'm glad I finally got to see the baby today and I can't wait to see you in person oh, thank again you. soon. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Next month we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, uh, in Austin together. All right, everyone. Yes.